So we now come to the Sir William Taylor lecture, our founding member of the association in 1932. William Taylor was the son of a mill owner and farmer from County Donegal. He enrolled in RCSI Medical School in 1889 at the age of 18 and concurrently attended Trinity College Dublin. He received many accolades during his undergraduate years, uh, including the gold medal oper in operative surgery at RCSI in 1893, uh, the, year, the same year that he received his licentiate. As you'll see from his picture, he served as a distinguished uh, surgeon in the First World War. Uh, and he received many awards for that. And following this war, he returned to Dublin and had a large surgical and innovative practice in Dublin. During this time, he also understood the physical and mental trauma of war and the importance of ongoing care and rehabilitation. He founded our association in 1932 with the motto Floriat Soldalitas Ruat Res, which means may our solidarity flourish, overcoming difficulties. And of course, that motto continues to be relevant in today's world. Next slide, please. I would now like to introduce another distinguished person, Professor Desmond O'Neill, who is going to talk on the topic of our longevity dividend, it's personal. Described by the Canadian Association of Gerontologists in 2017 as a world renowned geriatrician, Professor O'Neill is Professor of Geriatric Medicine in Tala University Hospital and TCD, and is a national comment media commentator. His clinical practice and research are focused on aging and neurosciences and how they interact with the humanities. In 2010, Professor O'Neill was awarded the All-Ireland Inspirational Award for his work on behalf of older people. So we are delighted to welcome Professor Desmond O'Neill to talk. Over to you, Desmond. Thanks very much and really delighted to be here. Thank you uh, um, really to the Alumni Association and indeed a couple of links myself, uh, my father FRCSI, my mother LRCPSI with uh, between uh, children three and eight and three of my brothers. But and for Sir William, uh, he he spent a fair bit of time in the Meath where I came back to Dublin as a consultant for us. So lots of nice links. So I'm trying to keep this within 30 minutes, if that's OK with everybody. And I suppose what I'm really trying to tease out here is the issue that if you're a cardiologist, there may or may not be somebody at home who's got heart disease. If you're a diabetologist, there may or may not be somebody at home with diabetes and nobody may get it. But if you're a geriatrician gerontologist, you're aware that everybody you know is going to age. So you're in the middle of a fascinating specialty where it's always around you. And I'm fortunate to be working in the area where people are at the richest stage of their and most interesting stage of their lives. And I think this is a bit of a secret that people perhaps ignore or are not aware of. And without being a Pollyanna or neglecting the downsides of any age, um, I think people fail to recognize that the, what they're going through with aging and getting into later life is actually a longevity dividend. And our key challenge is to make it personal, is for me to ask the next question. Next slide. And the real question is, do I really welcome my own age? Am I glad to be getting older? Do I recognize it as a benefit? 
or do I harbour negativities around it? Do I fear it? And these are the questions which I hope to try and tease out because our perceptions in ageing have been hugely encrusted by uh, misperceptions, by a failure model of ageing. And in fact, we fail to catch up with the fact that um, ageing and ageing through the ages, once people get past the age of 60, is an extraordinary bonus and benefit. Next slide. So I start nearly every talk I give, whether it's medical students, the general public, colleagues, I started with this fantastic piece of art, three meters by three meters in the Tate Modern. It's uh, radical, it's new, it's one of the pieces most sold in reproduction by the Tate. And it's by an 83 year old who's taken a radical turn in direction in his art destroying all sorts of ideas about older people being conservative. But next slide. The other key element is if I tell you that this is somebody who is bed bound and chair bound and 83 and you're listening to that phrase and you're saying, hmm, well, that doesn't sound like a great package. Matisse had an abdominal operation in his 70s and could no longer stand up and he only ever painted standing up. His hands and eyes worked fine. His brain worked fine. So he completely changed his style to a thing called decoupage, cutting out pieces. And in fact, if you have a piece of Manet reproduction at home, almost Matisse, it almost certainly comes from the later stages of life. And this is probably, the, if there were two slides to remember, it's the extraordinary piece of work of art and the fact that you're 83 and bed bound and chair bound and that the opportunities that are there and we mustn't let ourselves be beguiled or entrapped by what we see as the elements of vulnerability. Because very often, as we come to the end, our vulnerability is the agent of our strength. It's what makes us strive for meaning, for quality. Next slide. And so gerontology's study of aging is quite, quite fascinating. It's the broader sense of aging. And what makes life interesting is, as we say in gerontology, we're born copies, advance, but die as originals. So between nature and nurture, we become much more different from each other. That's what makes my practice so interesting because two 80 year olds are much more different from each other than two 40 year olds. And it's like a kind of a detective puzzle uh, how to personalize and do it in a rapid, speedy and efficient way. Next slide. So covering the master's course in gerontology in one slide, what are the hallmarks of aging? And the hallmarks of aging are probably threefold. The first is complexity. People become more complex. Life becomes richer, accumulated memories. But the second thing is there's growth and loss at all ages. And again, for those of you who know the neurosciences, you'll know that our neurons begin to shut down and die off from about the age of 27. There are things we could do when we're two that we can no longer do when we're seven, like learning to walk, be able to fall without hurting yourself, learning a language. There's growth and loss at all ages. And our danger sometimes in later life is we've let ourselves be beguiled by a discourse that only emphasizes the loss. So La Rochefoucauld, the French aphorist, said, en vieillissant, on devient plus fou et plus sage. In growing old, we become more mad and more wise. That is the more wise bit that often gets missed out. Next slide. So uh, Carl Jung put it very well. Um, he said a human being would certainly not grow to be 70 or 80 years old if this longevity had no meaning for the species to which he belongs. The afternoon of human life must also have a significance of its own and it cannot merely be a pitiful appendage to life's morning. Next slide. So we have all skin in the game, as I said at the beginning. We're all aging. You're going to be 30 minutes older by the end of the lecture. It may feel longer. And uh, that's me in my pram. You can tell my age by the type of pram, only used in Moore Street for selling vegetables now. But if you advance the slide there, there is my mother and father, and there are my paternal grandparents. And one of the extraordinary things is for many of us, I've had the opportunity of having a relationship with my father into his 80s and my mother into her 90s. And although, although they had compromises of memory, uh, our relationship matured in an opportunity that they didn't have with their grandparents. And these are extraordinary opportunities. So we all have skin in the game. So next slide. But the biggest puzzle to me 
is we feel warmth towards our parents, our grandparents, our aunts and our uncles. And the next thing we're talking about older people, we're talking about the elderly as if it's some group of aliens. And in fact, one of the extraordinary things about ageism, which is a, a natural, a, pre, a pre, sorry, not a natural, a prejudice against uh, uh, against later life is most prejudices are against somebody else. Racism is against other races, gender, sexism is against other genders, but actually aging is a discrimination against our own future selves. As I would say, it's like the turkeys not only voting for Christmas, but they preheat the oven and they self based. And there's lots of reasons for us to rethink our own intrinsic ageism because we're brought up in age societies and we need to find ways that we can move beyond this. So how do we bridge this gap? And one of the ways I've found to bridge this gap that's been very helpful from a scholarly point of view and very helpful from uh, diffusing out to the general public has been a, a branch of medical humanities which focuses on aging and particularly on longevity dividend and what we gain. And I always start out with great artists. Next slide. So the fantastic Louise Bourgeois in her 80s generating these these superb, striking, radically new sculptures uh, in London. Next slide. The amazing Guggenheim, which Frank Lloyd Wright only started conceiving uh, when he was 73. Next slide. Uh, the uh, remarkable late uh, albums of um, Leonard Cohen, I always found the bedside misery of the early stuff a bit, a bit depressing. Whereas if you take his old CD, old late CDs, old ideas and you want it darker, they're full of self mockery, they're light, they're humorous, they're dark. They bring it all together, absolutely superb. In movies, uh, we've written up quite a bit around this. I'm very interested in late life creativity in movies, but Clint Eastwood's Gran Torino, an absolutely superb acting, directing story for a 78 year old continued on with the mule and um, but in Gran Torino we also see uh, a wonderful way of showing the positivities of later life that he's altruistic and does the right thing at the end but he's curmudgeonly he, he's he's no picture poster boy for gentle nice older people and this is the thing about it I this is not a hagiography of later life it's the opportunities you can make but it doesn't mean it's all huggy and cuddly. Next slide. But it's interesting when I'm talking to the medical students about this, they're a great critical audience and they say, oh, that's all very well artists and composers. Verdi, for example, his late great operas. But what about real life? And one of the really, well, let's move on to the next thing. And the next thing would be politicians who shone in later life and weren't particularly uh, striking in earlier life. So de Gaulle, widely regarded as a thorn in the side of the Allies during World War II, coming out of retirement at the age of 67, leading the French Republic, getting them out of Algeria and stabilizing French democracy. Churchill, the disaster of Gallipoli as a young man, the saving of Britain in later life. Golda Meir, extraordinary capable uh, politician. Ronald Reagan, like him or love him, and we all picked up on his Alzheimer's early, certainly from his speech patterns, but managed to end the Cold War. <clears throat> and my favourite, personal favourite, is Field Marshal Mannerheim of Finland on the left, who, taken out of retirement at 72, helped a country of three and a half million, reminiscent of Ukraine, but even more extraordinary, three and a half million fight back the Russians, 140 million, twice, then was able to sue for peace, uh, losing Eastern Karelia, and was the only democracy that actually sided with the, with the Nazis, but managed to, to navigate all of that. Uh, so quite, quite extraordinary, the opportunities that people can get from their life experiences. But the students then say, oh, that's fine, politicians, but what about real life? And one of my key areas of interest, my, my, I'm very interested in occupational health, is the value and benefit of older workers. So, uh, for example, um, uh, next slide. Um, the, the, the economics dividend that arises out of older people. So, uh, and we'll come to the workers in a minute, sorry, got my slides, but one of the when, when the Irish ran a citizens assembly, the second one was an absolute dog. 
Instead of the Irish, it showed the prejudice that's so widespread in the Irish population. It was about uh, aging. And instead of looking at the opportunities that we were going to get from all of us having more vitality and energy and opportunities, it was all about pension costs and healthcare costs. And one of the really surprising things is that older people actually enrich societies. Uh, money transfers both ways. We know from the Tilda study, 23% of the over 50s uh, sent more than 5K down to the under 50s, and only 9% of the under 50s sent a similar amount northwards. Uh, they're st strong believers in strong civic society. They're new markets, they continue working, inheritance. And uh, Kevin Murphy of the University of Chicago estimated that the longevity increase uh, added 3.2 trillion a year to the US economy between 1970 and 2000, and a longevity bonus of 1.3 million to each US citizen. And th this has been repeated by UCL in London, and they reckoned 40 billion a year extra to the UK economy. This is only counterintuitive because we have grown up with encrusted stereotypical images of what aging might be aging as failure. Next slide. So on to workers. So this man has less good reflexes, slower reaction time and worse eyesight than a 25 year old Ryanair pilot. No disrespect to anyone as a Ryanair pilot in the family. But if you want to come down on the Hudson and survive, which do you want? Do you want the experience, the ability to read it, or uh, this man nearly 60, or do you want reaction times? And in fact, I do a lot, of my, one of my areas of research is, is driving, fitness to drive, and we're weaning people off their uh, fascination with reaction time. How you don't get into a crash is not by getting into the situation in the first place. So next slide. Uh, this translates into all forms, and I'm particularly interested in older drivers because 20, 25 years ago, a lot of European countries put in medical screening for older drivers because they thought all those illnesses, they must be dangerous. But you remember what I said about La Rochefoucauld, we become more mad and more wise. And this is an interesting study from the New England Journal of Medicine where they started giving ED physicians $35 if they picked up on people who had a medical condition relevant to fitness to drive and advise them. And blue is the amount of crashes they had per thousand drivers per year by age before the advice, and red is after the advice. And the extraordinary thing here is even before the advice, the over 75s with the most conditions had the least crashes and it floored out after giving the advice. So there's lots of interesting things to learn here that we tend for all that we talk about having health based and salutogenic systems. We tend to measure what people can't do and their disabilities rather than what they can do. And interestingly, in Australia, I've been saying this for years, but they've finally done it. They're using the experience and the characteristics and the manner of older drivers to train the younger drivers. So this is uh, finally people are beginning to realize the longevity dividend. So it's pretty much no matter where you turn, you'll find the longevity dividend. Next slide. And here's my favorite in a way. So my favorite is, and particularly this is one that often causes fun at uh, dinner parties late on a Saturday night after a few bottles of wine to say, come on Des, the grandparents driving their children. Well, in fact, if there's a crash and children are in the car, if the grandparents are driving, you have the risk of serious injury compared to the parents. And they don't use the safety features like the belts and seats, the safety seats as well. So if they did that, it'd be even better. And this seems again, it's only counterintuitive because of our prior perceptions. Again, one might say the parents might be rushing and that sort of thing, but um, you know, the big squeeze. But still, the longevity dividend is a gift not only for the older person, but you saw from the economics, from workers, social society, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Next slide. So how does it happen? And one of the important theories here is uh, a theory by two German gerontologists, Baltus and Baltus, which is as we get older and smarter, we do what's called selection, optimization, and compensation. 
And the pianist, uh, Arthur Rubinstein, uh, explained this very well before the theory was even elucidated. Somebody said, how come you're playing so well into your 80s? He continued playing to his 90s. He said, well, mm, I'm a bit more careful about the pieces I play. I don't play the fiendishly difficult ones. So they select. He says, I practice more now in my 80s than I did when I was in my 60s. So he's he's optimizing. But here's the genius of aging and the bit we don't pick up enough on. He said, when there's now a fast passage, I can't play as fast as I used to. I play the slow bit before it more slowly. So the fast bit appears fast, just as fast as it was. So this is really, I suppose, at the heart of it. Next slide. And this is the only other bit of gerontology I'll give you because it is a really interesting, it's a really interesting theory. It's the socio-emotional selectivity theory of Carstensen, Laura Carstensen. And what it, she's shown this empirically across a range of ages, that as we get nearer vulnerability, death, disability, aging, we begin to search for meaning. So we know, for example, older people rate the quality of friendship by the quality of the relationships they have. Younger people tend more towards the quantity. Uh, one of our more interesting experiments was to get a bunch of young people to imagine, to keep imagining that they were going to die in six months. And then she asked them, to, what watch would you buy? And they all bought sensible, high value watches that you could pass on to the next generation. And then she got them now to get them into state of mind. They've found the miracle cure. You're going to live forever or your usual lifespan. And the next thing they all got blingy, sparkly watches. So that might seem to trivialize it, but we can see this in, in relationships. We can see this in nearly all of the great artists began to search for meaning, strip down, begin to think less of what others thought of them. Very often, for example, their contemporaries thought they'd lost it. Titian his late paintings, Picasso, his late paintings, Foray, his late nocturnes. People thought, what's going on here? Now we value those pieces of art so much. Next slide, please. So we're all given, if you took the lifespan our grandparents had and you took the amount of hours we have and squashed it into that lifespan, you'd have to make a 29 hour day. This is from Tom uh, Kitwood, a, a Kirkwood, a very eminent um, gerontologist. So we're getting an extra five hours a day compared to our grandparents. And how are we receiving that? And that's the critical issue. So next slide. And what I'd like to do is just a little, just work our way through in a little bit about what, what we talk about when we talk about aging. Next slide. And editorial cartoons are a really um, a valuable insight and very often what they show is that ageism and negativity towards aging is the last bastion of acceptable prejudice. So again people might be amused at you know a senior citizen Bono who rather than portraying him you know doing a good thing in in, in a basement in Ukraine uh, you know with the Zimmer hunched over forgetful and then the uh, terrorist scare or a pensions time bomb and again Perhaps for another day it's a work is there 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 is no uh, real pensions time bomb um it there's there are policy shifts so next slide and this is an ad i'm really sorry i didn't you might think maybe oh he's getting very woke and politically correct here but the really tragic thing about this ad is the age denying element of it you might say I'll be more vital with these tablets from Seven Seas, or I'll have less wrinkles or a better complexion. But the idea that you would deny the idea of becoming old is so um, is so negative, it's so prejudicial to our future selves. And I'm going to explain why you really have skin in the game about your own future perception of aging. Next slide. So, and, and this does find its way through uh, into the highest echelons. Uh, we've written a paper in the BMJ about ageism in The Economist. And it's really important because The Economist is the most widely read newspaper in weekly newspaper in every all the parliaments around the world. So it's very influential on um, on policymakers. And this one was really 
gobsmacking in its uh, in its in its negativity. Thanks to us oldies, the world economy is threatened. I've given you a bit of chapter and verse on that. Kevin Murphy and other economists. China's prospects are stagnating. In fact, they might move towards a fairer society and inequality is rising. Inequality is not rising because of aging society. It's rising because of changing work practices, particularly large corporations and the hollow gig economy. But the absolute savage cut is that's nice, dear. And we have many, many um, uh, uh, much evidence about altruism among older people. Uh, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, um, when there were queues for cardiac surgery, uh, papers showed that older people in Britain and Italy would give their place in the queue to a younger person. We know actually in terms of who puts stuff in the green bins. If anyone has parents of teenagers and young adults who are all talk about the green greenness as they're using up carbon dioxide flying to Thailand and places, uh, it's actually been shown that older people actually do recycling better and they care more about the, uh, they, not that they care more, they do more uh, in, in concrete terms. So this, this is what we're fighting against in a way. Next slide. And Robert Butler was one of this extraordinary polymath, a wonderful geriatrician who wrote a great book, which is still very true, Why Survive Being Old in America. And this is still the truth. Now, it has improved, but the tragedy of old age is not the fact that each of us must grow old and die, but the process of doing so has been made unnecessarily and at times excruciatingly painful, humiliating, debilitating and isolating through insensitivity, ignorance and poverty. So these elements are, are still there. Next slide. And the problem with that, Susan Sontag in her wonderful illnesses metaphor, which she wrote when she had breast cancer in the 80s, and because everybody was nihilistic about breast cancer, the services were poor. And she wrote about that illness is the night side of life, a more onerous citizenship. Everyone who was born holds dual citizenship. So we're all the present or the future ill, but it's impossible to take up residence unprejudiced by the lurid metaphors with which it has been landscaped. Now we've seen what's happened in the three high seas of advocacy, cancer, children and cardiac, and that wave has yet to come here that we should reclaim the longevity dividend and how can we nurture and protect the longevity dividend. Next slide. But here's the personal thing and here's a real kicker for you and a red flag if you fear, dread or hold negative ideas about aging. There's an extraordinary amount of evidence that if you harbour negative perceptions of what it means to be old, you're more likely to experience hospitalisation, controlling for all the other factors. You have a lower likelihood to recover from a disability should you get one. You have a steeper hearing decline. You have elevated depression scores, more likely to suffer from a cardiovascular event, develop worse memory performance, all of these things. So we are hugely shaped by internal motivators, internal resources, and to consider your later life negatively. Now, I'm not a Pollyanna, I deal with dementia, stroke, Parkinson's all the time, but the bad stuff happens at all stages of life. And don't forget, we caricature things like loneliness, for example, the lonely old age. In fact, loneliness peaks in Western societies between 15 and 35. And if we caricature late life as the key time, A, we stigmatize late life, and B, we fail to look at lifespan policies that might improve loneliness uh, for everybody. Next slide. So I often <laughs> refer to this syndrome of being negative about later life and aging. It's as if the people of Chartres who have the fabulous windows can only see them in terms of cleaning and maintaining the windows rather than they're fantastic. And I'm afraid that's what the Irish Citizens Assembly on Aging was. It was a classic example of the Chartres Cathedral uh, complex uh, syndrome. Next slide. But there is hope out there and I'm, I'm seeing a shift and a change and even being invited here, I suppose, if it's the 90th, 90th anniversary of the alumni, it's good to have a geriatrician there, I suppose. Um, there's a really interesting um, uh, initiative taken by advocacy, academia um, and uh, a range of players in the US which we're trying to promote called reframing aging. And it's actually about being careful about our language in the same way 
that we'd have been careful about gender, the way we'd been careful about um, uh, uh, race. Next slide. So, for example, and this is a little bit of a crusade of ours, um, and we've just published this week a paper on that things have improved, but not there yet. Older people and the UN Human Rights have asked us, please, please, please do not use the phrase elderly, the term elderly for older people. They do not want it. There is no condition in which elderly is ever uh, a positive uh, adjective, whereas mature, well, you might have mature wine or a mature cheese at least. And actually what, what people want is they want older and that's that's it. Next slide. So what we've shown is that um, a, a bundle of journals actually have um, much more use of elderly rather than older. We're happy to say that in the aging journals it has improved. But actually, even here in, in Ireland, we have uh, still people talking about medicine for the elderly geriatricians. So we've got a job of work to do ourselves. Next slide. Uh, in our textbooks, um, one of the things that saddens me, and again, I've uh, got in touch with, with each of the editors of these and they have shifted, is when they talked about normal cognitive aging. Now, Sully Solomon getting down or the great composers or uh, poets, they gain. In fact, there's a very nice paper from Sean O'Keefe in Galway showing that the linguistic richness of George Bernard Shaw and P.G. Woodhouse not only stayed stable right to the 10th decade, but P.G. Woodhouse's linguistic richness got better and better. But 87% of textbooks describe normal cognitive aging in terms of loss and not in terms of what we gain in terms of wisdom, better strategic thinking, better social cognition and those sort of things. So next slide. So we need to rethink our phrases. And for example, most of us will at some stage have been carer for child, for adult, but for older relative. And it was one of my patients who made me think about this. She said, I hate it being called caregiver burden. And that's a picture from JAMA for a leaflet on caregiver burden. I want to look after my mother. It's the burdensome aspects of care. So let's not paint care always as a negative. It's a positive thing. Arthur Kleinman has written very, very well on the positive aspects of care for all of us. It's a natural part of our human condition and maturing. Next slide. And indeed, we have to move away from the, a useful term 20 years ago when we were trying to rethink aging was successful aging. The problem is the antonym, the opposite, is failed aging. And just as we saw, uh, and often the KPI is around physical fitness, which you may have no say in, like Matisse chair band and bed band. And I love this paper from Canada. I may be frail, but I ain't no failure. And to be, Michael D. Higgins caught this beautifully well, opening a, a unit for older people in Ireland. He said, we don't want a successful aging term that's just carrying middle age into later life. Later life has special stuff of its own. So the term that seems good is optimal aging, which suggests that it's been set, the thermostat is set by the person who's aging and not somebody outside. Next slide. So a couple of things, artists are on our side. Artists are smart people and they see trends. And if anybody ever asks me, what's the best movie about aging? I say unhesitatingly, the Pixar movie, Up. Uh, it, uh, like anybody who thinks it's a children's movie, it starts out with infertility, lifelong disappointment and death. And it only gets better after that. But it's more, and the, the, the old guy at the center of it, he's curmudgeonly, he's ungracious, but hugely does the right thing. It catches that idea of tough but frail wisdom. Cannot recommend it highly enough. Next slide. I was fortunate enough to be uh, advising the Abbey on a great production of A Midsummer's Night Dream, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, where everybody was over 60, a few were over 70 and a couple over 80. So they had to alter things and it was set in a nursing home. And instead of worrying about your daughter getting married, it was your mother getting remarried. But it was and it was just fantastic opportunity. And I think it was one of the cast who said this phrase to me that once you glimpse the inner life and complexity of older people, you cannot retreat to a vision defined by their disability. 
Next slide, we're nearly there now. Uh, so if I were to say a book that struck me as truly wonderful to get the sassiness, the directness, the fun of aging, it's the famous science fiction writer Ursula Le Guin, this book written in her 80s, No Time to Spare. Now, actually, her science fiction left me cold. It's not my jam, but this is fantastic. I've known the sissy strikes back. She's giving out about the old age isn't for sissies poster. I've known clear headed, clear hearted people in their 90s. They didn't think they were young. They knew with patient canny clarity how old they were. If I'm 90 and believe I'm 45, I'm headed for a very bad time trying to get out of the bathtub. Even if I'm 70 and think I'm 40, I'm fooling myself to the extent of almost certainly acting like an awful fool. Next slide. Look at me They're talking about the poster. I snarled at them. I can't run. I can't lift barbells. And the thought of me in a fight fit, tight fitting, minimal clothing is appalling in all ways. I am a sissy. I always was. Who are you jocks to say old age isn't for me? The compensations of getting old, such as they are, aren't in the field of athletic pro prowess. I think that's why the saying and the poster annoy me so much. They're not only insulting to sissies, they're beside the point. I'd like a poster showing two old people with stoop backs and arthritic hands and time worn faces sitting, talking deep, deep in conversation. And the slogan would be old age is not for the young. Next slide. So progress can happen and uh, I'm, I'm guilty of what Stephen Jay Gould would call academic promiscuity. But one of the things I'm proudest of is we, a group of us got a letter into the Lancet and they decided to put a quote from it on the front page. And when the second most impact, high, second highest impact journal in the world in medicine puts a celebration of aging on the front cover, I think it must be a hopeful portent for you, me and everybody else to say, yes, I welcome my aging. This love phrase, aging is most often framed in negative terms, questioning whether health services, welfare provision and economic growth are sustainable. We argue that instead of being portrayed as a problem, increased human longevity should be a cause for celebration. So I'm going to finish off with a poem because WB8 said, of our conflict with others, we make prose of our conflict with ourselves, we make poetry. And perhaps negativity and a failure to appreciate our longevity event is a conflict with ourselves. So the great uh, Nobel laureate, uh, Polish-American poet, Czesław Miłosz, uh, has this wonderful poem, Late Ripeness, about approaching his 90th year. Not soon, uh, and it catches for me what you gain, that clarity, meaning, perspective. As late as the approach of my 90th year, I felt a door opening in me and I entered the clarity of early morning. One after another, my former lives were departing like ships together with their sorrow and the country's cities, gardens, the bays of seas assigned to my brush came closer, ready now to be described better than they were before. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Professor O'Neill. That was a superb lecture and it really showed us how longevity has meaning and is a gift that we as individuals and society should value. And you thoroughly showed us that through those wonderful, wonderful slides. Thank you so much. Uh, I think they, uh, I will concentrate on optimal aging uh, <laughs> and uh, I think the phrase uh, we are born as copies uh, but die as individuals is a terrific phrase. So thank you very much and I now hand over to Erica um, to see are there any questions Erica. Thank you very much, Des. That was very interesting. And I'm, uh, being a geriatrician myself, I really, really enjoyed it, as I think we all did. The first question we have for you is what can we do to practically, can we, what can we do practically to optimise our ageing experience? 
Yeah, well, well, I might surprise you a little here um, in saying that the first thing is not it's not a neoliberal thing of what can I just do for myself? And I think the, one of the most important things is to strive for equity and equality in society. And I'll explain why. Uh, in most of the developed world, not only are we getting a longer lifespan, but we're getting a longer healthy life expectancy, the amount of time within that later life that we're healthy. That is drawing back in the UK and the USA. And as clearly as we can see, that's because of rising inequality in both of those societies. So there's an important issue around actually striving for that. And the, the other important reason for that is is about intergenerational solidarity. So if 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 we're seen to just have a neoliberal thing where we're just going for ourselves, that being said, much of the rest of the, of of the advice is actually those things that are good for cardiovascular health and education. Now, one of the really interesting things we know Alzheimer's disease, the prevalence of the sorry, the incidence is dropping. The incidence is almost halved in Framingham. Now, Framingham is relatively affluent, but the most important factor associated with the drop in incidence of Alzheimer's is uh, education. So little did Don O'Malley think when he instituted free secondary education in the 1960s against much resistance is that might be one of the most important things to keep our brains healthy. But health, the education, healthy lifestyle um, and there's a couple of I, so, social engagement. Uh, uh, and again, I, I think in due measure is really important because I think we're all different and we're all individual. And, you know, some people thrive in isolation, but for most of us, uh, social engagement uh, uh, and activity is important. No, no smoking. Um, uh, and not again, not to get overly obsessed with things like Sudoku and all that sort of crosswords and that sort of thing. I mean, if you enjoy them, that's fine, but don't feel guilty if you're not doing them. Dancing, pro dancing or choral singing, two great things that get you out, exercise you, get you going. But the, the act, act, those sort of things, but as I said, to keep that broader perspective on creating a society where aging will be supported. Thank you very much, interesting. Uh, another one here, here is how do we reconcile age related disability with the longevity dividend? Yeah, I mean, that's where, you know, it's 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 I, I've it's I, I've a healthy brood of of critical children and and and, and uh, at home. So do I. <laughs> Give me plenty of pushback on these sort of things. And, you know, so I am very keen, you know, not to be seen as a Pollyanna here. But we're all going to get some condition and we're all going to die and almost certainly for most of it that is going to happen in the later stage of life it's going to be a shorter period because of the compression of morbidity so for example my father got 82 really good years and then a bad year and the day 82 to 1 is a fantastic uh, uh, ratio I, I suppose it puts the question back to us and again it goes back a little bit to what I said in the last question. It's about creating um, um, circumstances whereby that disability will be uh, alleviated to the greatest extent possible so that there will be service and support for those sort of those, those sort of conditions. And it's about ensuring that <coughs> adult people who are looking after adults get gerontologically attuned and trained. And I think that that's uh, Ireland is fortunate in a way, certainly at the medical end, in that geriatric medicine has developed very strongly, is very prestigious, well sought after. I'm, I'm not blowing a trumpet here now, but it's very competitive, for example, to be an SPR. And we're seeing gerontological nursing also beginning to shift as well. So a long way to go. And the stories of any of us who've encountered the health service know we haven't got to a gerontologically attuned health service, but we must start pushing for one and I think a key area the, the most important group really is nursing is and and to promote gerontologically attuned nursing. Thank you. There's some other questions but there I think you've covered most of them there with those with those answers. So thank you very much Professor O'Neill.